call to worship. You noticed in our bulletin in the order of service, there is a time whereby we acknowledge call to worship. What does that mean? It means that individuals who gather together in one sacred space in this sanctuary and also who are worshiping with us online, together we come together to look at the focus for worship on a particular Sunday. It's part of that transformative experience that takes place when followers of Jesus Christ come together as one community of faith. We continue our worship series, Worship with Rejoicing, Worshiping with Rejoicing, and today the focus is on call to worship. And you notice as you looked at and as you read the call to worship, we're talking about baggage that we're to bring to worship. We were talking about the need for us to bring our true and authentic selves to worship. Put away the mask. Bring your true self. One of the reasons why I so appreciate children, especially in a worship service, is because God has given children wiggles. <laughs> and God has given children voices. So Amaya and I have this understanding. She can help me preach by speaking while I'm speaking or even by standing up and moving around. Amaya and I have this understanding. Now, adults, please don't speak while I'm speaking. <laughs> please don't get up and walk around. <laughs> Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart bless you this day. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray with thanksgiving, amen. It was an interesting situation. They would gather for worship. And yet, it was obvious that there were certain members of this congregation who had this exclusive mindset that were not as welcoming to the other worshipers. And Paul took note of it. And so he wrote a letter to the church at Ephesus. Because you see, this congregation was made up of former Jews who were now followers of Jesus Christ and Gentiles who had not had a relationship with God prior to coming to understand, know, and receive Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. Paul recognized that there were these former Jews who continued to bring into this congregation former attitudes that served as barriers because you see the Jews saw the Gentiles as those who were enemies. They were hostile towards the Gentiles. And that attitude carried over into the church. They thought they were superior. Have you ever experienced anyone like that in your particular congregation where they think because they've attended church longer than you have, because they read through the Bible at least four times, because they know people who you don't know within the church. They just think they're superior. So Paul writes a letter to the church at Ephesus, and it's a letter that I would suggest to you will benefit all communities of faith. Because you see, more and more, individual communities of faith are becoming less and less homogeneous. As a matter of fact, I would suggest to you that um, hmm, it's rare to find a homogeneous congregation. People come from different cultures. People come from different experiences. Paul writes this letter, and he, he writes a letter, and he's focusing on the Gentiles. And what he says to the Gentiles in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 is, individually, you remember how you used to live. You, you had no God. You had no hope. You were out there on your own, following your own gods. But God, in God's mercy, introduced you to Jesus Christ. And by faith, you accepted Jesus Christ. So beginning with verses 8 and 9 and 10, 
He says, for by faith you have been saved, not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So if you think you're in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ because of your works, no. It's by faith and only by faith. If you think your good works are going to get you into heaven, no. It's by faith, faith in Jesus Christ that will bless you with entrance into God's community of faith, God's family, and into heaven. And so as we look at verses 11 through 22, Paul shares with the Gentiles and also with the Jews who are overhearing the Christian Jews the benefits of being in a relationship with God. He reminds them as he reminds us because of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, you Gentiles and you former Jews who are now Jewish Christians, you have been reconciled to God and to one another. Isn't that exciting to know that because of Jesus Christ's death on the cross, we have this opportunity to be reconciled to God? We can now be in a relationship with God because of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And not only that, but because of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, we can be and we are reconciled to one another. Nothing, no barriers are to stand in the way from our being reconciled to one another. Now, let me just say this. This is a sidebar for those persons who are a part of the community of faith and you're still holding on to, you fill in the blank, animosity, hatred, unforgiveness towards those within the body of Christ, it's time for you to enter into your prayer closet and pray and ask God to forgive you and to help you to get over that animosity, that hatred, that ill will, whatever. Paul reminds them, you've been reconciled to God and you've been reconciled to one another. And you've been given the ministry of reconciliation, which means now it's those who have been reconciled. You can go and tell others what God has done through Jesus Christ's death on the cross. The other thing that Paul reminds them of is that because of this reconciliation, there is now this unity you are a new creation. The old has passed away. Don't hold on to your wonderful awards and who you were, your position, your prestige, your power. No, 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 don't hold on to that. No, no. You are a new creation. The old has passed away. And I have to share that with someone who keeps remembering what they have done in the past and it continues to be a burden to them. They, they just can't let go of the mistakes they've made, the pain they've caused. Beloved, you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. You've asked for forgiveness. So walk in that freedom. A new creation. We're all one. As Galatians chapter 2, verses 17 through 19 reminds us, no longer can you say, well, you know, I'm a Jew. I'm a Gentile. I'm free. I'm a slave. No. We're all one in Jesus Christ. Now, what's priceless, and this is just a quick sidebar, is even in our oneness, because God has created us to be so diverse, we do have our identities, first and foremost, in Jesus Christ. 
And then because you may be a male or a female, or because you may be from Jamaica or Cambodia, you have certain cultures that are to be celebrated. So we're one, we're new, and now there is this unity. Within the United Methodist Church, we know that we are not called to be homogeneous when it comes to our thoughts. We have individuals who are very conservative when it comes to their theological positions. We have others who are more, um, the word would be used here, more progressive in their theological positions. This is what we believe as United Methodists. We believe that through Jesus Christ, it's not a matter of either or, it's a matter of both and. We agree with who God is. We agree with who Jesus Christ is. We agree with who the Holy Spirit is and the work of the Holy Spirit. We acknowledge and we recognize that we may have different theological perspectives. And, and we can disagree without becoming disagreeable because I would suggest to you, as followers of Jesus Christ, who remember what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, we recognize that it's important for us to maintain this spirit of unity. And then finally, Paul reminds this church at Ephesus that you who have accepted Jesus Christ into your life as your Savior and Lord, you are now the building in which God dwells. When we think about building, we think about brick, mortar, air conditioning, heating services. <laughs> no. Paul is referring to the people who have invited Jesus Christ into their life as Savior and Lord. Us. We create this building, this temple where God dwells. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. To me, this is really good news. One, I have this relationship with God, and I have this relationship with each and every one of you through Jesus Christ. And I, we've been given this, this ministry of reconciliation, sharing with people who just think there's no hope for them, because of the ways in which they've lived their lives, we can tell them, but there is hope through Jesus Christ. And not only that, but because of our relationship with God and our relationship with one another, we are able to be the people of God where God dwells, to be empowered to do all that God is calling us to do to love one another with the love of Jesus Christ and to share that love with the world that needs to know so that they too can be reconciled to God. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, for reminding us that you love us and that you've invited us to be a part of your family through Jesus Christ. And thank you for that love that nothing and no one will ever be able to get in the way of. For those who may not have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, we pray that you will touch their hearts and their minds, and may they do so this day. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.